So glycine is the chief amino acid in broth, bone broth. So, and glycine regulates dopamine levels. And dopamine is this key neurotransmitter. And when people get addicted to things, they do so because they normally have low dopamine and the alcohol or the sex or the drug or whatever raises dopamine. Same with gambling or whatever. They want that dopamine high. Well, the way to make sure that your dopamine is always at the right level is to have broth every day in soups or a mug of broth or whatever. If your dopamine is too low, it's hard to get going and get up in the morning, broth will raise it. If your dopamine is too high and you're sort of hyper enthusiastic all the time, the broth will bring it down to the right level. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. When working with someone with addiction, depression, or mental illness, it's important to ask them straight up, what did you have for breakfast? This is episode 361, and our guest today is Sally Fallon Morell. Sally is the president of the Weston A. Price Foundation and the author of of Nourishing Diets, among many other amazing books. Today, Sally helps us understand the link between what we eat and our mental health. The two are definitely related. Nutrient deficiencies can lead to issues with mood and poor sleep and mental instability. Sally reviews what is needed for a healthy brain and cellular function, like cholesterol and saturated fats, for example. She also explains how animal fats work synergistically in the body to create our own cannabinoids, which are chemicals that regulate reward pathways and increase dopamine release. Sally helps us understand what to put on the table to strengthen mental and emotional stability and what to avoid. Bone broth is in, for example. MSG, soy, and GMOs are out. Basically, Sally helps us understand how to build a nutrient-dense foundation for good mental and physical health. Before we get into it, I want to let you know that the foundation has lots of resources in Spanish. Tenemos recursos en español. Yes, so we have pamphlets, an Instagram account, which is at Weston A. Price underscore español, Weston A. Price guión bajo español, and our podcast, of course, Tradiciones Sabias, is starting back up. So go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on WAPF en español to find everything that you may need, to find resources in Spanish for good health. And Earth Runners, our ancestors were virtually always grounded. They went around barefoot or wearing leather-soled moccasins or sandals, which kept them in touch with the earth. Our shoes, among other things, keep us insulated, literally disconnecting us from the ground. It's time to get back to that connection with the earth to allow the body to take in electrons to help restore our natural electric state for balance and better health. This is one reason I love Earthrunner's sandals. They feature a copper earthing plug and conductive laces that keep me grounded literally to the earth. I have several pair because they're just so comfortable and I'm addicted to the feeling, to be honest. Earthrunner's has created these minimalist earthing sandals based on one of the oldest designs for footwear in history, the Warache. They revamped it with Vibram soles and earthing technology. So basically, you get the most minimalist, natural, and grounded shoe experience you've ever had. So go for it. Restore your natural connection with the earth via earthing to enjoy its benefits, just as our ancestors did. So go to earthrunners.com and use the code WISE for 10% off at checkout. I'm telling you, you can rewild and reconnect with Earthrunners. Again, it's earthrunners.com and use the code WISE for 10% off. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Sally. Thank you, Hilda. It's always great to be here. We're going to address a topic that is so important right now. It's the topic of mental health. Talk to us about what you know about this. <laughs> well... It's funny you should ask me because I've just been reading a book about addictions and not once in this book. And, and the author talks about dopamine and, you know, feel good chemicals and so forth. But not once in the book is diet mentioned except to say that people get addicted to sugar, salt and fat. 
And <laughs> that just shows a real lack of understanding. I mean, to me, the very first question you ask anyone who's suffering from addiction, depression, mental issues is, what did you have for breakfast? What do you eat for breakfast? And of course, what do you eat the rest of the day? But if you start your day off with cereal and skim milk or a big pastry or Pop-Tart <laughs> and a big cup of coffee, yes, you're going to have some mental problems during the day, low blood sugar and, and so forth. And I always say the very first thing you do in treating mental illness is get people on good high-fat foods. That makes so much sense because what is good for our bodies and keeping us strong is also good for our minds. Absolutely. And the opposite is true. When we eat junk, then we're not giving our brain even the building blocks we're it needs. We're not nourishing our brains. And the brain needs to be nourished just like every other part of the body. And the key nourishment for the brain is cholesterol. It's the key nutrient for brain health. And then all of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, and K, and the B vitamins, and so forth and so on. One example I like to give when we talk about addictions, there is a chemical in the body that's exactly the same as what's in marijuana. We call them endocannabinoids. Mm. It's more than one chemical. but And we have receptors for these endocannabinoids. And the healthy body, when it's properly nourished, makes endocannabinoids in just the right amount. And I like to say the natural state of the human body is to be high all the time. Mm. And when you're very well nourished like this, I remember my brother telling me once, tried some marijuana, and he said, I don't get it, Sally. He said, it didn't do anything for me. Well, that's because we were a family that ate butter and cream and eggs. And in those foods, you have something called arachidonic acid. It's only in animal fats, and we make our natural endocannabinoids out of arachidonic acid. Now, for 100 years, this nation has been avoiding animal fats more and more. They, vegetable oils are substituting for the animal fats. And so naturally, we have a nation that's easily addicted to something like marijuana because our bodies are not making the marijuana inside that we need. And so when they take marijuana, they suddenly feel normal. It's not just good, it's normal. And they will do anything to repeat that feeling. And you know what you're talking about, this positive feeling that comes from being well-nourished. People could even do their own little experiment. Grab coffee and a muffin for breakfast. Yes. See how you feel. Notice your mood and your thinking. Yes. Yes. And then juxtapose that with a breakfast full of healthy fats and proteins. Mm. and Bacon you know, and eggs. And yes. yes. Butter and raw milk. And, and then see how you feel yeah. and, and yes. how you think. Yes, exactly. And, and another problem that happens when people are eating these high-carb breakfasts is... By mid-morning, they have very low blood sugar, and you really cannot think when your blood sugar is low. So it's off to the vending machine or to the kitchen for, you know, a candy bar or something like that. And just the cycle repeats over and over again, the blood sugar roller coaster. Now, what would you say to someone who says, oh, Sally, this is far too simplistic. Of course, you're mentioning food because you're in this yeah. real food movement, <laughs> but it's not that easy. Well, nothing is easy in, when it comes to mental health and addictions, I, and I don't want to make it seem easy, but we could make it easier mm -hmm. <laughs> if we added nutrition to the list of therapies that you're doing. And maybe even looked at that first, right? Yes, and look at it first, yes. I love and that. And I like your idea. Keep a notebook, the typical a sad breakfast <laughs> and see how you feel at 10 o'clock in the morning and then eat bacon and eggs and see how you feel at 10 in the morning. It made a drastic difference for me. Is that right? Yes. yes. I used to teach exercise classes and I would feel my blood sugar dip in the middle of the workout. I'd have to grab a power bar or anything yeah. to just boost my blood sugar mm -hmm. again. I thought, well, I'm just one of those people that has this issue. And when I began eating a healthier, more wise tradition style breakfast, I could float till two, three in the afternoon right. and I'd be fine. Yes. Exactly. So let's address, I know we have a brochure yes. called Nutrition for Mental Health. Let's use this as a springboard for more conversation. The first question posed in the brochure is, does our diet affect our mental and emotional health? And talk to us more about what can happen. We did talk about low blood sugar. What are some other changes that can happen to the body when we're not well nourished? Right. Well, if, in fact, the very first one is low blood sugar. And mm -hmm. when you have low blood sugar, Things don't go well. You are depressed. You are anxious. You're moody. I mean, I was a low blood sugar person, a very different personality when I was a teenager because I was eating sugar all the time. 
And you know what they call that now, too? They'll say hangry. People yes. joke about, oh, I'm hangry. You shouldn't have to hit that state if you're well nourished, yes, right? Yes, exactly right. So, but they're noticing the difference with the poor nutrition and the mood. Absolutely. So the, the first thing we list is low blood sugar. Second is the gut brain connection. And my goodness, what we have discovered about the gut bacteria is so amazing. First of all, the gut bacteria help regulate your hormone balance, your uh, you know estrogen, progesterone, testosterone balance. But more importantly, the gut bacteria actually produce, manufacture feel good chemicals like serotonin and GABA and you know that's cholesterol hormones and all. They make these things. So a lot about feeling good is having being good in the gut, having good gut bacteria. And why wouldn't we have good gut bacteria? <laughs> well, for one thing, we're not eating foods that contain good bacteria. So we're not eating foods like sauerkraut and kefir and all of these lacto-fermented foods that should be in the diet on a daily basis. Absolutely. We should be renewing this gut bacteria on a daily basis. Secondly, we're eating a lot of foods that yeast loves. So if we eat a lot of sugar, the candida proliferate and crowd out the good bacteria. And then there are certain foods that actually destroy gut bacteria, and one of them is breakfast cereals. <laughs> yes, there was a study recently in, in Europe showing that these extruded cereals, and that's what these cereals are, really are very bad for the gut bacteria. Well, you know what's occurring to me right now is that real foods like raw milk and yogurt and some of the fermented foods you just mentioned are alive. And of course, they're teeming with bacteria that are good for us. But a lot of the foods we eat are packaged and processed, which means they're kind of dead, right? They are dead. In fact, we had Beverly Rubick look at raw milk and pasteurized milk through the electron, through the dark phase microscope. And she said you, the raw milk, and we have these pictures in our on our website, is got a colloidal structure to it, and it, it looks alive. And pasteurized milk, that colloidal structure is gone. It's completely flat. So we need more living food we in our lives. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Wow. Thank you for enlightening, it, enlightening mm -hmm. us there about the gut-brain connection. So next is thyroid disorders and mental health. If you have hyperactive or hypo thyroid conditions, these definitely lead to mental health problems, especially if they're severe. So very important to get your thyroid working and in balance. And of course, I love to say this, the very best food for the thyroid gland is butter. Uh, it is butter. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> butter contains three nutrients that the thyroid needs. One is vitamin A. You cannot make thyroid hormones without vitamin A. Two is iodine and any butter produced within 60 miles of the ocean will contain nice iodine or if they're using iodine on the teats to uh, wash the teats. And the third one is butyric acid. And butyric acid is necessary for the thyroid receptors to work. And if you have a healthy colon, the uh, butyric acid is being produced in the colon and absorbed but another in fact the only the really only dietary source is butter and i've seen people claim that you can get butyric acid from coconut oil but that's not the case oh. butter is butyric acid is unique to butter that's why it's called butyric acid oh interesting <laughs> yes, yes well and i feel like there is a thyroid crisis among young women so many of them are on kind of synthetic hormones yes. to kind of get that rolling yes. right. One in two people in this country has some kind of thyroid condition. Wow. And it's something that could affect their mental health, obviously, and yes. their overall health. And yes. maybe butter could be part of the solution. Well, it is. And as I say, we've been 100 years now with the demonization of butter and thyroid conditions have just skyrocketed during this period. Do you think more people are listening, though, Sally, and returning to these real foods? <laughs> That's a really good question. Yes, it's a minority, definite minority, but there are people who are listening and returning to these foods. I'm so grateful. F funny, I've had people tell me, especially young women, I had to get over my sense of guilt for eating butter. <laughs> and I remember once I was in a restaurant, I was at my son's uh, college graduation, and next to me was a table with a mom and she had a kind of overweight daughter who had ordered pancakes for breakfast and the daughter wanted some butter on the pancakes and she slapped her hand and she said, you can't have this butter. It'll make you fat. 
<gasps> but it was okay for her to eat the pancakes and the, the sugar syrup. And, oh, it's and, all upside down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing we list is a vegetarian diet. And studies have shown, this is, I'm not making this up, that vegetarians have more mental illness and that's because they're not getting certain nutrients that we get only from animal foods that are critical for mental health, starting with B12. And that's well known that B12 is important for mental health. And also vitamins A and D and minerals like zinc and iron, which are critical for good, stable mental health. I remember when you were on a panel and there was a debate about eating meat or not eating meat. And it was you and some vegans and vegetarians. And you said they were so angry. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> and it's in part because the yeah. diet is affecting their mental yes. and emotional health. A known symptom of B12 deficiency is a tendency to irrational anger. And when we think of someone who has good mental health, you think of somebody who's stable, who doesn't fly off the handle, who who handles things well, you know, isn't doesn't get offended easily. And that's B12 deficiency. So there's a very good explanation for why uh, vegetarians have more mental health issues. And I understand many of them after five to seven years, well, not many, I won't say, make a generalization, but a group of them return to eating a more wise traditions kind of diet, including animal products, because they notice this in their mood and also in their bodies, kind of yes. a deterioration. Yes. Well, the function. first thing that happens is they start getting a lot of cavities because the teeth are affected first. And then um, they feel weak or angry or yes. depressed. Yes. And they kind of have a constant need to keep eating. Yeah. But unfortunately, as you said, they're not eating the nutrient rich foods that could really help them. Yes. Okay. What else, though, Sally, let's say I'm just a regular person trying to eat the wise traditions way. What should I be aware of that could be affecting my mental health that may unwittingly be a part of my diet? Yes. Well, uh, we've talked about sweeteners, refined Mm -hmm. sweeteners, and that includes high fructose corn syrup, uh, agave, fruit juices. They're just naked sugar. Modern vegetable oils, which are displacing the animal fats. And as I said, the animal fats contain nutrients or components that are critical for mental health, starting with arachidonic acid. This is a type of omega-6 fatty acid that's exclusively in animal fats, and we make the cannabinoids out of them. Also, a vitamin A, and vitamin A is critical for being able to plan and complete tasks. And to me, that is the hallmark of good mental health, that you've Think of C or think of something that needs to be done. You figure out a solution and then you carry out that solution, whether it's just a minor thing in your kitchen or, you know, changing the world. But that's what makes you happy. That's the real thing that makes you happy. You know, good food and sex and a nice house and all these things. Yeah, there it's nice. But what really makes people happy is accomplishment. And vitamin A is just critical for creating those uh, mental attitudes that help you to accomplish things. I was thinking just now that some people listening to you might think, okay, planning, making a process and then executing. I'm tired just thinking about that. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas it should be exhilarating. Right? Yes. The things that people find stressful are actually wonderful challenges that we are here to meet and overcome. And that's exhilarating. But if you're not well nourished, you won't, you just can't do that. And you even become anxious and easily overwhelmed at the thought of doing such things. Yes, exactly. exactly. Instead of exhilarated and accomplished. Right. Here's something we can do. So that's why I say that the vegetable oils are bad because they displace the types of fats that we need to have good mental health. Coming up, Sally offers insights about what ingredients to avoid that destabilize our mental health. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Do you have trouble sleeping? Is insomnia making it impossible for you to get through your days? Is your mind racing with worries and a never-ending to-do list at night? Then try a sleep meditation from the Sleep Meditation for Women podcast. It will help you fall asleep and stay asleep with ease. These meditations help calm the mind, relax the body, and help you fall asleep peacefully. Each sleep meditation is created with love for those who feel called to listen. And it's brought to you by the Women's Meditation Network and hosted by my good friend, Katie Kremitzos. I sometimes listen to these meditations while driving. 
Not to fall asleep, obviously, but to unwind from the day and as a much better alternative than listening to the news. They even have some meditations that are simply instrumental tracks. I love them. So get the noise out of your head with a sleep podcast from the Women's Meditation Network. Get comfy, press play, and let yourself be guided into dreamland. You can get access, by the way, to hundreds of free guided meditations now by subscribing to the Sleep Meditation for Women podcast. Just search for Sleep Meditation for Women on your favorite podcast player, subscribe, and press play now. Or visit womensmeditationnetwork.com slash sleep podcast. Here's to more sweet dreams. An optimal carnivore. Organ meats are some of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. The folks at Optimal Carnivore want to make it easy for us to access them without the process of preparing them and trying to make them tasty. So they started sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. They chose New Zealand because it is a pure source, and they freeze-dry the organs to preserve all of the vitamins, minerals, proteins, and enzymes. And knowing that our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal, they created a unique blend of nine different organs in their grass-fed organ complex. It's a powerful combination, including beef liver, brain, thymus, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, lung, and gallbladder. It's a real nose-to-tail solution, since each organ contains its own unique benefits and nutritional profile. And all of Optimal Carnivore's products are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished and free of hormones, pesticides, antibiotics, and GMOs. They can cover your bases at home or while traveling. I often take these supplements just to fill in the gaps in my diet. Plus, Optimal Carnivore plants one tree for every product sold, which helps the environment. So go to Amazon.com slash Optimal Carnivore and order the grass-fed organ complex that I mentioned, grass-fed bone marrow, and their grass-fed liver products. Use the code WESTIN10 to save 10% at checkout. That's Amazon.com slash Optimal Carnivore and the code WESTIN10 to save 10% on all products. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Tradition. MSG is a neurotoxin that can cause uh, mental problems and, and all the additives, artificial dyes, flavorings, and preservatives. And of course, if we're sourcing our food well and we know our farmer, we're not going to have these hidden additives and preservatives in our food. Because yeah. I don't even know what MSG is in. I imagine it's a flavor enhancer that's found in a lot of packaged and processed foods. Uh, yes, it's also in skim milk. What? Yes, yes. The vitamins that they add to skim milk are attached to MSG. I mean... It's hiding in, in lots of places. Wheat, now, especially if you're not preparing it properly, if you are sensitive to gluten, uh, that can cause uh, some mental problems. Soy depresses thyroid function mm. and is an endocrine disruptor. So again, you have potential for damaging mental health. Aspartame, the artificial sweeteners, and the genetically modified organisms as well, because they upset the gut flora. They're designed to do that. And how many of our foods are GMO? Are you know? Are, well, have... so corn and soy are the two major sources of genetically modified organisms. Another one, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this, is most cheese because they use genetically modified bacteria to make the rennet for the cheese. Oh no, I hadn't heard this. Yes, yes. And so, we thought cheese was such a perfect food. Well, it is if you're you know using the right ingredients. You want cheese with animal rennet because that's the natural rennet. The wheat, surprisingly, the wheat is not genetically modified, and I'm not sure why they never did genetically modify <laughs> wheat, but unfortunately, wheat is sprayed with Roundup just before harvest as a desiccant, so the main source of Roundup in the diet is wheat. Oh my goodness. And so we're getting this overload of glyphosate mm -hmm. that is impairing our all sorts functions. of enzymes and everything. Yeah. Every time we bite into a piece of bread. If it's not organic. So for your wheat products, you want organic sourdough, organic so it doesn't contain Roundup, and sourdough so that the gluten and all the irritating components have been neutralized by the processing, by the preparation techniques. I feel like it also, what does Stephanie Seneff say that it Glyphosate comes into our system and it takes the place of glycine yes, yes. in the body. And so does and, that lead? And by the way, glycine, I, I'm so glad you brought this up because we really should have something in here about glycine. Oh, we do actually on oh, the good, other side. Good, good. So glycine is the chief amino acid in broth, bone broth. So, And glycine regulates 
dopamine levels. And dopamine is this key neurotransmitter. And when people get addicted to things, they do so because they normally have low dopamine and the alcohol or the sex or the drug or whatever raises dopamine. Same with gambling or whatever. They want that dopamine high. Well, the way to make sure that your dopamine is always at the right level is to have broth every day in soups or a mug of broth or whatever. If your dopamine is too low, it's hard to get going and get up in the morning, broth will raise it. If your dopamine is too high and you're sort of hyper enthusiastic all the time, the broth will bring it down to the right level. No, I remember you told me that years ago, and I have experienced it personally. I used to have a kind of nervous energy, mm-hmm. yes. and now I simply have energy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thankful for that. But honestly, Sally, I look around, and I see a lot of my friends who are in their 20s, and they are fatigued. They're anxious. They've they've got that low dopamine that you're describing. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, they get on this roller coaster of, you know, pumping in the caffeine through the coffee and, you know, it's... Or the alcohol or whatever. They're looking for the dopamine high. And sugar, by the way, also will temporarily raise dopamine. Right. No wonder people associate it with like that good feeling, but they can get that good stable feeling through broth that has the glycine that we really need. Yeah. All these things that, well, almost tend to be criticized by people in this field like dopamine and serotonin and cannabinoids and everything. We're supposed to make those in our body and supposed to have hormones that regulate them so it doesn't get too high or too low. And that's that's what the food does, the right food. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad we're addressing this today because we are on this mental health track and everyone's kind of coming at it from a different direction. But I appreciate this nutrition emphasis today. (laughs) On the other side of the flyer that we're looking at, we list uh, nutrient deficiencies. And there's some B vitamins, vitamins A and D, vitamin C, zinc, cholesterol, because so many of these hormones are made of cholesterol, and then glycine, which is in the broth. And one of the things that we emphasize here is that the cholesterol-lowering drugs are the just like the pathway to depression and anger. Irrational anger is a sign of low cholesterol. And when the drugs take the drugs, they're, they're trying to get people's cholesterol way too low. Cholesterol is something that rises gradually and naturally with age because cholesterol protects us against cancer and protects our brains. And the idea of reducing someone's cholesterol, someone who's 60 years old, reducing it to 200 is, is folly. They need their cholesterol to be a little higher. And let's talk about um, the vitamin deficiencies you were mentioning. How can we correct them? So we've already talked about how you can get vitamin A and D. Um, These are from the organ meats and the fats. Mm -hmm. The B vitamins, a very good source of B vitamins are the fermented foods because they're all increased when you make sauerkraut or when you do sourdough bread and I didn't know that. I always thought of B vitamins as coming from liver. Well, liver is a wonderful source. Yeah. Uh, Liver is a wonderful source of riboflavin, which is, um, we don't get that from any other foods. Wow. And then vitamin C, of course. And Americans actually get far more vitamin C than our ancestors did because we do have fresh fruits and vegetables available. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people find that they're helped with a vitamin C supplement, natural Mm -hmm. vitamin C supplement. Zinc, of course, is in meat and shellfish. Those are the two main sources. Well, I have a little story to tell you about that. It's found in oysters, right? Yes. And I know your husband loves oh, oysters. He does, yes. <laughs> My father is now, he just turned 90, and he eats oysters regularly. And I'm telling you, Sally, just like Jeffrey, he's spry and strong, and, and, alert. Like my father has a lot going for him. And I attribute it in part to eating the oysters. amount he eats yes. of oysters. Yes. And for those who don't like oysters, you can now get desiccated oysters, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm taking every day because the oyster is not something that appeals to me. It doesn't appeal to everyone, that's yes. for sure. Right. And then the cholesterol, which is only in organ meats, animal fats, animal foods, and the glycine, which we get from bone broth. So isn't it interesting that all of these nutrients that support mental health are the nutrients that we emphasize in the Wise Traditions diet. It is interesting. No wonder we're so stable and happy and healthy. Yes, (laughs) yes. And anyone who comes to our conferences can see this, you know, just how fun the people are and having a good time, but alert and interested and pay attention and 
so forth. Now, there are environmental factors that might also affect our mental health. I'm not trying to make it like everyone who eats this way is going to be stable. There may be other factors that could impinge on their health. Isn't that right? Even relationship issues. Yes. I mean, we're not trying to make this a one one factor thing. I, mental illness is complex, involves the soul and involves the spirit. And it has to do with your surroundings and your relationships and, and so forth. But the healthy person with really good mental health uh, can observe these things and take the necessary steps to make changes. And so we're giving them that foundation or yes. offering the suggestion that food may be an important place to start to regain their mental health and stability. Yes, yes indeed. Well, I'm so glad we had this conversation, Sally. Thank you, Hilda. And thanks for all you do. And I think this idea of a mental health series is excellent. Very good. Our guest today was Sally fallon Morell. Check out her blog at nourishingtraditions.com. And I'm Hilda Labrador, the host and producer of the Wise Traditions podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. Now, this is the point where I usually invite you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or to write a letter to the editor, and those things are great. I still want you to do those, but there's something new also. We are trying to put together your story, your testimonial of how the Weston A. Price Foundation and or the Wise Traditions Diet has changed your life. So I want to invite you to leave a two to three minute message on the westonaprice.org website. You go to the website, you click on the podcast page, and there's a little drop down menu box that says about the show. Go there and you'll see SpeakPipe. It's just a little app or a plugin on our website that makes it easy for you to leave us a message. Start with your name, where you're from, and tell us a little bit about your story. You might just hear it on a future podcast. And thank you in advance. Thanks again for listening. Stay well, my friend. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.